Moon Sunday School series, and I'm going to welcome all of the guests we have here that are new to this place. Thank you for joining us. And by the way, there's coffee and cookies afterwards. I've been promising people that, especially the ones who thought it was too early this morning. And uh, welcome to uh, the regular attendees, and we welcome Devin here this morning to cap off our uh, focus on on poverty. We've had Becky Lewis Pankratz speak to us about the cycles of poverty and the mindset of, of those that are stuck in the cycles and, and talked about the circles model of, of working together as community uh, and making connections. And, uh, and I'm excited about today's topic because when I read about it in the Hutch News, I said, man, I want to hear this. And it used to be that community members got to judge uh, senior projects in school. Did they do it this year again? They didn't, not this year. And I was hoping maybe I could sit in on it then. Well, it didn't happen. So when we were talking about poverty, Devin's name came up immediately as a topic, uh, as someone to, to hear on this topic because of his unique uh, experience and his unique uh, uh, project. Uh, Devin just graduated from Bueller High School. He was in the graduating class of 2016, and he's participated in a whole slew of of, of school activities. As he says, any extracurricular activity he joined as it arose. When he was presented with the idea of a senior project, which every senior is at Bueller High School, uh, he decided to use this opportunity to help others. And uh, he achieved this by living homeless. And that's what hopefully we'll hear about a little bit today. And that's the experience that was written up in the Hutch News. And if you go online, that story is still there along with, with some of those photos. From that experience, not only did he do his senior project, but he hopes to, uh, he hopes to write a novel entitled True Home. It's getting a little rowdy out in the wings here. <laughs> and it's my wife, too. I don't know. <laughs> Don't they know it's church? They should be quiet. <laughs> not, not, sorry, that sounded bad. People should be quiet. <laughs> we'll hear about it later. <laughs> he wants to write a novel, and I look forward to this, uh, entitled True Home, describing what he went through those four days of his project in Hutchinson and what others go through for a lifetime. And part of those cycles that we heard about, uh, Rebecca speak to us about the last two Sundays. Devin is planning to attend the uh, University of Kansas in fall. He's planning to major in religious studies. He also got accepted into the accelerated law program through the, the School of Law. And with this, he hopes to join the International Justice Mission, a group that travels the globe and frees people from uh, sex slavery, which is a major, major international topic. And if you think that uh, Kansas is not part of that topic, uh, listen to some of the stories that National Public Radio has put out about Kansas being at the crossroads of some of this, this trade. Through his education, and this is the part I, that really moves me as well, through his education and a call from God, he plans to help others no matter the cost. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you that you call people and you call people into all corners of this world to bring light, to help even the least of these. And I pray today as Devin speaks that you open his mouth to speak and that his experience become vivid. Vivid not only as a curiosity, but vivid as a call to action. Vivid as uh, a call for us to say, all right, what can we do? How can we enter the story of all of our brothers and sisters? Open our ears to hear, our minds to understand, and our hearts to accept. And we pray this in the name of Jesus Christ, whom we follow. Amen. I'm going to welcome Devin here and come speak to us from your experience. Well, good morning. That was a beautiful intro. Did I write that? Yeah. <laughs> I have edited some of it. Oh. Well, thank you. It was great. <laughs> All right. So like he said, um, each senior at Bueller is presented the opportunity to research and do an extension activity over any topic that they choose. Um, 
some kids, I know one of my friends made a drift trike where he attached a little motor to a bicycle and made it do circles, it was awesome. Um, but also, I have thought about this project since my sophomore year. And a lot of people are like, well, where did that come from? Like, who chooses to be homeless? And honestly, I have no idea. Um, I remember running one morning at cross country and some kids were like talking about senior projects, like, Devin, what do you think you'll do? It's sophomore year, I have no idea. So I just kind of spit something out. I was like, yeah, I'll live homeless. Why not? What could go wrong, right? <laughs> uh, this year I found out that there's a lot of work going into that that I did not expect. Um, the original plan was to go to Hutchinson High School and attend as a student homeless uh, that is kind of stereotypically homeless. Um, I kind of feel bad saying that after what I've been through, but dirty and having nowhere to go. Well, um, just because of security reasons, that didn't go over. So I decided to just go live on the streets and see what that's like. Um, I actually gave a sermon at my personal church in Hutch, and so if you don't mind, I'm kind of going to go through that as well. And so I actually have some scripture here. Uh, might be a little small, but I'll go ahead and read it anyway. Then the king will say to those on his right, Come, you who are blessed by my Father, take your inheritance, the kingdom prepared for you since the creation of the world. For I was hungry, and you gave me something to eat. I was thirsty, and you gave me something to drink. I was a stranger, and you invited me in. I needed clothes, and you clothed me. I was sick, and you looked after me. I was in prison, and you came to visit me. Then the righteous will answer him, Lord, when did we see you hungry and feed you, or thirsty and give you something to drink? When did we see you a stranger and invite you in, or needing clothes and clothe you? When did we see you sick or in prison and go to visit you? And the king will reply, truly I tell you, whatever you did for one of the least of these brothers and sisters of mine, you did for me. And so you kind of see there that everyone, <laughs> you should really help everyone. And that's really what I plan to do with this project. Um, and it's not over. Um, I am in the middle of writing a book. Um, it's taking a lot longer than I thought it would. But <laughs> it's, it's coming. And so I'd like to start with uh, one single question. How can you help? And a lot of people are like, oh, it's too hard. I don't have time. I can't go help people. But it really isn't. Um, another question, what's in your pockets? We all have one of these, a little smartphone, or maybe even a wallet or a billfold, or in your purse, if you will. And most of us have credit cards, most of us have cash, and there's people in Hutch that don't have homes. And there's people who hold up signs that ask for money. And sometimes a lot of people don't know whether or not to give to them because, oh, they could be scam artists. But does that matter? That doesn't sound right, but if there's someone asking for money as Christians, should we deny them? Even if they are going to use it for selfish purposes, they're still asking us for something. And even though it might not be the greatest decision for them, if we're asked, we should give. And so my first night was pretty hectic. Um, I remember packing everything away, uh, trying to fit everything into my backpack, which is only a little bigger than a normal backpack, but still hard to keep everything in if you're planning on a four-day trip when you have nothing else. Um, I remember strapping my, back, or my uh, sleeping bag to the backpack, and there's not really much to strap there, so it was a little jankity, it was wagging all over the place. It's kind of like a little dog tail just hanging back there. But finally I started heading out the door and I headed up out about 2.30ish, 2.45. And I had this idea of going to different churches to see how Christians treat those that they perceive as homeless. And so about two hours of walking later, I got to Cross Point. Well the thing about walking that long is if you've ever done it, you start to notice rhythms, your bag swaying back and forth, your feet going at the same tempo, and then your mind begins to wander to other things as well. I remember thinking on my walk there, I see a lot of trash. That's no big surprise. But one piece of trash dug out to me, and it was a pair of prescription glasses. Like, how do you lose that? Like, how, do you just drop them on the side of the road and be like, oh, I don't need those? What? 
I, I don't understand how you can lose some of these things. And so just as you're walking, you kind of tend to wander to different places. And that was kind of my saving grace for a lot of this, um, just kind of getting lost to the imagination. Well, about two hours later, my legs are aching. It's been terrible. My backpack has been swaying back and forth, just digging into my shoulders. And I'm relieved to finally get to this church. But I get there, and I start thinking, what are these people going to look at me? Like, how are they going to look at me and perceive me? What are they going to say to me? Well, if we've ever driven by Cross Point before a service, you know they have parking lot attendants. And so I was walking by down the sidewalk, and I saw one of these attendants. And so I pretended to kind of walk by, and I stopped, and I looked at him, and I said, do you have a service going on right now? And kind of cautiously, he's like, yeah. And I was like, well, would I be welcome? He's like, oh, of course, anyone's welcome. So I walk in through the front doors, and there's people, like, smiling to see me there. I'm dirty, I'm gross, I'm sweaty, I don't smell good, I can smell myself. It's disgusting, but these people are happy to see me there, and it's amazing. I'm blown away by the kindness these people showed me, and it was kind of nice to know that there are churches out there that do that, and I know most of the churches I've spoken at, um, they'd all do the same, and I'm sure this one would be the exact same, even though Bueller doesn't have that high population of homeless. Um, and so, after the service, I had to find a place to sleep. And I had the idea of sleeping behind the old Dillons on 30th. Um, it's been abandoned, there's no one there. And so I started walking that way, which was another maybe 30 minute walk. And then a car stops in front of me in a driveway. And I'm like, okay, this is a little weird. I'm walking down the road, it's dark outside, and a car stops in front of me. And this lady rolls down our window and she holds out a hot chocolate, and she says, I was sitting behind you in the service, and I saw you just kind of walk out, and I was gonna give this to my son, but I think you, you need it more. Well, funny story, come to find out after, she had read my article in the paper, and she messaged me on Facebook, and she said, hey, I just wanna let you know that my husband, the day before, had just lost his job, and I really don't do stuff like that for people, but something told me to do that for you. Her husband had just lost his job. They had no financial means, and she gave some random guy on the side of the road a hot chocolate. Now that's just awesome. And I didn't even ask, she just did it. And I found that pretty moving. Um, and so after, after that encounter, I had this hot chocolate in my hands, kind of holding it, trying to keep my hands warm. And I got to the old Dillon's and there really wasn't as much shelter as I thought. I didn't really scope it out before, I kinda wanted it to be a little bit more realistic than that. And so I got there, I went around the building, and there's nowhere there that I could sleep. Plus, the amount of gang symbols spray painted everywhere, it just wasn't that safe. And so I began pondering, now, where do I go if this one place that I planned on sleeping doesn't work out? Where do I go now? And the answer probably isn't that surprising. My church was fairly close, and it's the only place I felt safe. And so I walked uh, the rest of the way to my home church and slept there, or at least I tried to sleep. Um, it was winter, so it got dark really, really soon, and I had been walking for hours that day. And being a cross-country runner, I didn't expect that problem. I was like, oh, I'm in cross-country. I can walk as long as I want, and I won't get tired. But obviously, you use different leg muscles when you walk than when you run, and I was exhausted. So about seven o'clock, I laid down and tried to go to sleep with my one sleeping bag. And it was a terrible idea. I, I used to be in Boy Scouts, and I know this was a terrible idea, and looking back now, I'm like, why did I even try to do that? If you've ever tried to go, be go to bed at seven o'clock, it, it doesn't really work out all that well. And it was winter, and it was cold. So I laid there for hours on the dirt in my sleeping bag, trying to fall asleep, but it was freezing outside and I couldn't fall asleep. So I sat there for hours and hours, just trying to fall asleep, just shivering. And finally, I had to call my family and have them take me home because I was running the risk of a legit health problem. And I wasn't gonna put myself through that. And so through the next few days, I kind of was down on myself. I was like, man, I couldn't even do it one night. What's wrong with me? 
and I was under the impression that I had failed my whole entire senior project. But then I started thinking, wait, I had a coat, I had pants, I had shoes, I had socks, I had a sleeping bag, and I couldn't do one night. And there's people out there who have less than me, and they do it every night. Just to give you an image, there are people in New York who sleep on the subway vents because hot air rises out of them. And if they don't get enough, enough hot air, they have nowhere to go. And there's people in the winter in New York that freeze to death on these vents. They die out there because they have nowhere to turn and nowhere to go. And that could have been me. I mean, if I didn't have a loving family that came and rescued me, I could have gotten sick. And that scared me. And so that was kind of my first night in a short little rundown. Of course, my mind was going everywhere, of course. Um, but there's one question that always kind of bugged me, and it's, will people notice me? Will they, like, look at me? Will they say anything to me? And so for the next few days, walking around, that's what I was worried about. It wasn't, what will I do? Of course, that was a worry. Where do I go after I walk? Where can I sit inside for hours and not be bothered by people? Where can I sit and not get kicked out? Because obviously restaurants kind of look at you funny if you sit there for too long. I work in one, I should know. Um, and so I spent a lot of times, time at the public library, um, Hastings, and Metropolitan Coffee because I could sit there and no one would really care. But one thing that I always noticed is people don't look at you. If you make eye contact with them, they look away as fast as they can. The last day of my project, I held up a sign, and it said, Hungry, please help. And I held it on the corner of 17th and Lorraine, which is one of the busiest intersections in town. And I held it up about lunchtime. And I was passed by hundreds of cars. And out of the hundreds of cars that passed me by, only two stopped. Two out of hundreds. Now, that's a little small to me for a town the size of Hutch. And these two cars, one of them was a middle-aged woman, and she was the first one to stop. And she said, I've lived in Phoenix, I've lived in Denver, I, she'd lived in New York, and she knew what true homelessness was. And she looked at me, and she held out some money, and she said, well, I can either give you this, or I can drive you to the place I work and pay for your meal. And she worked at Olive Garden. She was going to pay for an Olive Garden meal for someone she'd never met before. And I kind of smiled and I laughed. And she said, do you even need this money? And so, no, I didn't take it. I said, this is for a senior project. And she said, people in places like Hutch or Bueller or smaller towns, even though homelessness is a problem, they don't realize it because we don't see it. We're too sparse of a place to actually see it. But go to New York. Go to Phoenix, go to Denver, and it's there, and you see it. But what do you do when you see it? You just kind of pass it by. I'm guilty of that as well. We all are. And it's not even just homeless. There's other problems that exist in this world. Um, and so she was just kind of appalled that no one had stopped yet, and I'd been there for about 20 minutes. And then the second car that stopped was kids about my age. And they were a little bit more timid. They just kind of opened their window a little bit and were kind of poking some money out. And it was pretty comical. And I said, I don't need this. This is for my project. And I thanked them, and they went on their way. But it's still amazing that only two cars stopped. And I only stayed there for 30 minutes. So maybe more would have stopped. But 30 minutes was the most I could do. That 30 minutes was one of the most degrading times of my life, holding up a sign that gave away everything. You said, I can't live on my own. I need random acts of kindness to stay alive. And that's degrading, and it's humiliating, and people do it every day. And 30 minutes was all I could do, and I'm glad it's over. So what did I notice when I held up this sign? I noticed people who would look at me and look away. I noticed people who would stare. Those were a slight minority. They were 
pretty far and few between the people who actually looked at me and made eye contact. Everyone else just kind of looked away. And that, that hurt. There is a study from the University of Michigan's med school that found that social rejection has the same effect on the brain as physical pain. So that term, a slap in the face, it's, it's true. When I was ignored by those hundreds of cars, it was like a slap in the face every time. When someone leaves you out of something, it's like a slap in the face to the brain. So think about that next time you see someone asking or begging. And so the number one problem that I faced through this entire project was the social rejection. Because sometimes people aren't all that nice and they don't really want to include you. And I'm guilty of this as well. We don't really like that person. They're a little weird. So we'll just kind of leave them to this side. But as, as Christians, should, should we really be doing that? We should really try to include that person. Be that, single that person out and be like, hey, you should come hang out with us. So you don't slap them in the face. And so the question is not anymore what's in your pockets, but what's in your heart. Because when I was on this entire journey, I didn't need money. I didn't need things. I just needed someone to talk to. And there were a couple of times I actually had to call some friends and go talk to them because it was driving me insane sitting there by myself. One of the leading causes of homelessness is ment mental illness. And after doing it for four days, I don't doubt that because I was completely and utterly focused on survival and where I should go and who would talk to me. I was so focused on other things that I didn't care about anything else. This whole time I was taking notes of everything so I could write this book. And I was taking notes and I noticed after the fact that I was making spelling mistakes that I should never have made. I was making spelling mistakes and grammar mistakes that what's, why did I have that? Why did I do that? And it kind of struck me that I was so focused on other things that these things that I normally do just weren't in front of me anymore. They were off to the side. And that's just one thing that I noticed. And it was strange to me to be so focused on something else that everything else didn't matter. And so imagine doing this every day and living in the cold and focusing on other things not focused on what clothes you'll wear, but if you have clothes to wear. I had one pair of clothes, and by the end of it, I was dirty and disgusting, and I took the longest shower of my life. And hygiene is a big thing. One thing that really drove me insane was not being able to brush my teeth. I didn't have toothpaste or a toothbrush, and if you've ever not brushed your teeth before, it's disgusting. It's terrible. And so I really, really encourage you to the next time you see someone begging on a corner, sure, give them cash, give them something. But just look at them and smile. Look at them and have a conversation with them. Take them out to coffee. We always say we don't have time. But one thing I've noticed about this summer especially is we really do have time. We say we don't have time, but we take time for ourselves. We take a lot of time for ourselves. And so I encourage you to work so hard the other six days of the week, work so hard every waking minute for the betterment of others that coming to church is the easiest thing you do all week. Work so hard that coming and sitting down is your recharging. Work so hard that you see so many people happy that you can come here and tell stories of what you did. One thing that I hear a lot and I see a lot that kind of bugs me, it's not intentional, people don't do it on purpose, but the newspaper article, for instance, it was all about me and all about my project. 
are you, you kind of seeing what I'm going for here? It wasn't about the people I'm trying to help, it was about me. It's this media that focuses on one thing and not another. They have our attention so focused on the big, extravagant things that the things that are off to the side that really do need our attention aren't focused on anymore. And so, I have one last verse, if you don't mind. Luke 14, 13 through 14, so two verses, I'm sorry. But when you give a feast, invite the poor, the crippled, the lame, the blind, and you will be blessed because they cannot repay you. For you will be repaid at the resurrection of the just. So do it because you can't get anything out of it. Because that's what God has called us to do. And so if anyone has any questions about my project or what I did or anything else, I am definitely open to it. Did you encounter any other homeless people during your four-day deal? I did every once in a while. I tended to stay more towards the northern end of Hutch because it's known to be a little bit safer. Um, I actually talked to police department and they told me to stay probably north of 17th, probably north of 11th because that would be where I'd be the safest. Um, and so there were a couple people that I did notice that you can assume are homeless but also going through this, I didn't want to assume anymore, if that makes any sense. So yes and no. Um, I saw some people that I could easily pick out as, yeah, that person's homeless, but then again, you never know. So I didn't really get the chance to go talk to anyone and be like, hey, are you homeless? Because I'm homeless. Like, if, um, so there were probably some that I did see, but I didn't get the chance to have a conversation with them. Um, as part of the book I'm going to write, I plan on putting on a second part and going to um, soup kitchen or seeing if I can find anyone to talk to and be like, hey, what's your story? Um, because obviously my story is unique and so is everyone else's. And so that will be part of the novel I plan to write is, hey, you're homeless, so tell me about it. So if that kind of answers your question in a really roundabout way. <laughs> In the percentile, were there women and men even, or more men than women? Um, Homelessness-wise, uh, typically, uh, again, I didn't really see many, but in your soup kitchens, in your homeless shelters, there are typically more men, um, just because people are more willing to help women. Just kind of how it is. Um, but a lot of times, there are women with children, and there's a lot of them. If I remember a statistic, there was, I want to say 500,000, 18 and younger, on the streets by themselves, um, children. And women and men, I'd say men are a little bit more likely to be homeless, but that's just kind of, like I said, more people are willing to help women. I know your parents, but tell them, <laughs> tell them what your parents thought about this all through your experience. Oh, oh, they hated it. <laughs> uh, they were completely freaked out by the whole thing, uh, which is why I waited until I was 18 to do this project. <laughs> A lot of people are like, well, why didn't you do it in warmer weather? Well, that's because I turned 18 December 31st. And <laughs> So, yeah, I did it in January because I was old enough and it was the soonest I could do it because I wanted to get it done and over with so I could start working on other parts of this project. And yeah, they hated it. <laughs> what is the difference of losing your safety net, having all these circumstances and becoming homeless versus you having chosen to be homeless? What, is the different, what are the differences, you think? Um, to me, I believe that what I did is luxury compared to what people have to go through. Um, I mean, I don't know if any of one, anyone in this room has ever lost a house or a car or family, 
Um, after the fact, I got to <coughs> talk to a family, and they run this organization called Off the Streets Foundation. I encourage you to look it up, but it is a man, his wife, and their son. And their son has been going to school, but he recently uh, graduated early at the age of 16 so he could travel with his parents, and they are homeless. Now what they do is they live out of their van and they collect money. If you've ever seen the guy with the smile sign in Hutch, holds up a sign that says smile, it's him. Um, and the money they collect, obviously they are homeless, so they use a small portion of it for themselves. But they go around the country and anyone that they see is homeless that they can help, they do that. But I did get to talk to him, and about 10 years ago, he's been homeless for 10 years, he's been doing this for 10 years. Um, basically, he was a tattoo artist, and he suffered an aneurysm. And he couldn't get disability, he couldn't get a job back, and he lost everything. And he said, it sucks. He still has family he could go live with, but he says he's a grown man. Why would he want to go live with his family again? Um, and it's what he loves doing, he loves helping people. So he did go through that. He lost everything. Um, he was making a ton of money and just lost it. Poof, gone. And he said it was terrible. Um, it was the most frightened he'd been ever. And I cannot even imagine going through that. What I did, again, is luxury. I had a coat and a sleeping bag and some people just have the t-shirt and jeans that they're wearing. And so, yeah, I, what they go through is beyond me, even though I did it. <laughs> Hi, I'm Lewis. Uh, one of the experiences that uh, Dorothy and I have uh, observed every Friday morning, and in fact, every morning, Monday through Friday, um, there's an opportunity, I believe, to interview people who are homeless. Uh, and there's a wide spectrum of ages, we notice. Uh, they sit in the Salvation Army next to the food bank, waiting for handouts of bakery goods. Uh, and uh, there's probably anywhere from 10 to 20 people sitting there and uh, it would be a great opportunity to just sit down with them and begin talking to them and listening to their stories. I can't do that because I'm working in the food bank at the same <laughs> time, but it is something that I would, I personally would think would be a great experience. And I think there is probably a wide range of homeless. You know, what I've seen is uh, automobiles are used as homes, kitchens, and sleeping quarters. Mm -hmm. And some people are very mobile. So, um, you know, they may be uh, found in the library. They may be found, as you did. And in fact, um, some of the city, larger cities we've been in, uh, we, I've been in bathrooms and libraries and uh, seen people actually take off their shirts and doing a shower with the, with the wash sink. And um, I think that's kind of an interesting thing to, to be a part of. Um, the Salvation Army does have showers in their bathrooms and some use that. So it's a little bit like, you know, if you're homeless long enough, you begin to find out, you know, what things you can use and what things you can't use. But uh, I can see it as, um, uh, you know, and I think the mental health idea, there is some cases I believe very strongly that mental illness leads to a homeless, erratic lifestyle. And in other cases, um, you know, financial collapse, uh, marriage collapse, a relationship collapse. Um, can lead one to become homeless, and then uh, after a while, yes, you can get mentally disturbed, and uh, certainly the chemicals in the brain behave differently. But I think what you've shared with us this morning is a glimpse 
into how do you start identifying uh, with people that are homeless and uh, it uh, is isn't really you know if you go to the Salvation Army you see that's south of 17th Street so you want to be a little careful <laughs> thank you a uh, question I have you said the first night you weren't able to stay out mm -hmm. What about the other nights, and where did you stay? The other nights, um, I actually did stay at my church again. I just kind of switched places. Um, it kind of was a little bit more sheltered, and I actually doubled up my sleeping bag. That night I was home, I shoved another sleeping bag inside of it. Um, one thing that I did, instead of carrying them both around, because they do get pretty heavy, is I actually left them in a bush. And so another thing that's kind of going through your mind is, will it still be there when I'm back? And so I did double up my sleeping bag, and I did stay out the rest of the nights, the other two nights. And um, yeah, so it was just kind of a balance between staying kind of comfortable and um, trying to force myself to be outside. Hi, I'm Louise. <laughs> I've known Devin since he was born. Um, when there are some resources for the homeless people, that there are, uh, there's a homeless shelter, uh, the Salvation Army, the the food bank, the the soup kitchen, and of course all these things are south of 17th Street. Yeah. <laughs> um, if you really were homeless and you would venture that direction, how do you think that they, how do they find out about these things? How you know, <laughs> how would that happen? <laughs> um, I actually have been talking to a few churches in Hudge. And a lot of churches have showers or resources that people can use. And there's actually several churches in town, again, south of 17th. I was just encouraged to stay away from that, so I did. Um, but if anyone were to go into one of these churches and say, hey, can I get some help? They would give them help. Um, there's also, when I went to the library, I was asking about different things, and they gave me a flyer, and it had all these places that had so different resources, food, showers, clothes, and they gave me a pamphlet and it had all these places with all the addresses and all the times I could go there and all these things that I could get. And I don't know where to get these pamphlets other than the library, but it was amazing. Um, I might have to go ask for another one. I'm not sure where I put mine, but um, yeah, it was an amazing thing that they had this list and I was blown away that they had it. Um, and so yeah, the public library has them and I'm sure churches around town do. Um, and I was just amazed to find out before I did this project, I didn't know that churches would open their doors to let people shower there, um, just because the church I go to wouldn't really do that, sadly. So there are different churches and businesses that would help out people. A lot of this discussion has been about how to help the homeless. Is there anything available to help them not be homeless? Um, there, in Hutch, it's a little bit more difficult. Um, there are places called uh, resource shelters. Um, we have the homeless shelter, we have Noel, and that's the biggest one here. And what Noel really does is their shelter is an emergency shelter. And what that is, is you can only stay there 30 days, and after 30 days you can't come back. Well, that might sound a little cruel, um, but the point of that is to not create dependence and to try and get them moving up. What Noel does is they have their emergency shelter and they have these shelters all the way up until they have low-income housing. So what Noel really does is they get these people and they try and give them the resources to support themselves. Um, and so there's this stigma behind homeless people that, oh, they're just lazy and don't wanna work. Um, and that's just not always the case. Um, there are people who would work, but even McDonald's doesn't want someone working there who can't take a shower. Um, and so it is really difficult to find ways to get them through and up there, especially as an independent person. But there are organizations 
that do stuff like that. And in bigger cities, it's a little bit more common, whereas Hutch, we have the one Bueller kind of area. Um, I think it's, Noel is actually Reno County, if I believe. So it's all the surrounding areas that they try and do this. Um, so yeah, there's different programs and there's definitely different takes on ways. Noel is just one way. Um, there's other places such as places in Texas and other states that create these small homes. And what they are is basically a trailer. It's like a 10 foot by six foot trailer and they just make a little home on top of it and give people a home so they can live somewhere. Um, and so there's a ton of different ways to help these people. Um, and obviously location wise, it's hard to figure out one solution. Um, in Texas, those little homes might work, but in Hutch, there's not really a place to do that. And so it's really trying to find a balance between the resources that they have as a person and the resources we have as a community to really get them back through and have them become self-dependent again. Hello, uh, my name is Sarah. I just returned from Colorado Springs doing 10 months of service and there I was working in a transitional shelter for homeless families. Um, and I've got a couple questions. Um, the first one being, how did this experience change your view of homelessness or those in a homeless situation? Um, I know through where I worked, um, everybody has it. We all look at, we, we dehumanize people that are in that situation. Um, and so I guess my second question would be, how do you think we as a community can work on that and work on seeing them as the people that they are instead of just a homeless person? Um, definitely before I did this, I had my own stigmas. Um, I remember thinking as I was walking out of my door for the first time, I remember walking down the street and being like, oh, I feel normal, like I don't feel weird. And um, so I kind of had this vision in my mind that I would feel disgusting all the time and that I would feel like less than human the entire time. And so it really did open my eyes to the fact that they, they are people. <laughs> and um, even though I knew that before the project, it didn't really set in until I was doing it myself. And so as a community, um, it sounds like you've been doing a program on poverty, and that's pretty awesome. Um, and so I'm sure that helps, but also, I'll just put it this way, if everyone in this room were to volunteer a different day at the soup kitchen for a week, if they did that every week, the same day, every week, for a year, they wouldn't need help for a whole year. And that's just the people in this congregation. And so I think one of the best ways that we can kind of get those stigmas out of ourselves, out of our own minds, and um, just kind of actually see them as equals is to go help them. Um, it sounds like that's exactly what you did. Just go and help them. Go talk to them. You really won't realize who someone is until you talk to them. And that's equally as true for a group of people. Um, and so until we as a community kind of say, hey, you should really go talk to this person, um, they're going to be like lepers to us. They're gross. I can't talk to them. They're not human. It's kind of the same thing. Um, kind of follow what Jesus did and go talk to the lepers. Go be with them. And same with homeless, just go be with them, go talk to them. And that would probably be the best way for people to start seeing, hey, they really are people just like me. So. Anyone else? Thank you so much. I am very intrigued with the social inclusion part of it on so many different levels. And it seems to me it <clears throat> puts straight to the idea of biblical hospitality, the, the idea that we pursue. We don't wait for people to come to us. We take the first step. We make the first smile. We engage the eye contact. We don't wait till someone requests it of us. And I, I, I like that, that component of it, uh, having experienced that in Bolivia. Having experienced that in Bolivia for the last few years, uh, <clears throat> when God seems so far away at times, it's in the unexpected hospitality uh, where God beco becomes real. And I'd like to close 
with these words from Menno Simons, uh, after whom the Mennonite church is named, as he reflects on what it means to have faith. And I think it encapsulates what we heard this morning. True evangelical faith does not, cannot lie dormant, cannot lie sleeping. It clothes the naked. It feeds the hungry. It comforts the sorrowful. It shelters the destitute. It serves those that harm it. It binds up that which is wounded. It becomes all things to all people. May it be so. Thank you, Devin, for calling us to that. Amen. You are all invited to coffee and cookies downstairs, and uh, you are all invited, too, to join us for worship that begins at 1040.